So next we're going to have, we're going to be talking to Carrie Bossett. Carrie runs the blog of Suburbia. Now today what we're going to be doing is kind of a, a little bit of what we're kind of doing today, right? Kind of doing a, a virtual tasting, but this is actually a host of a kick-ass bourbon tasting, whether you're virtual or in person. So Carrie, how you doing? Good, man. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and take myself off. If you need anything, just let me know. Sounds good. So if any of you need to take a 30 minute bathroom break, now might be a good time to go ahead and do that. Um, again, thank you, uh, Kenny and the Bourbon Pursuit team for putting this thing together. Um, I know these are really weird times for all of us. I know that we wish we could be at the Derby and we could uh, be celebrating together, but I think it's awesome that whiskey and bourbon can bring us all together in such a fashion that, you know, even in these, these strange times, we have something positive to look forward to. So thank you guys for that. Uh, again, this is Carrie Bosick. I have a blog called suburbia.com, S-U-B-O-U-R-B-I-A. A little bit about me. I started blogging in 2014 um, after I realized, honestly, I just love bourbon, um, whiskey, and rye. Uh, created a blog called Suburbia. And the main thing that I had always said was that I would always have honest reviews when it came to my stuff. So unfortunately, that meant that a lot of the media samples I were getting were cut off over time because um, I maybe have been a little too honest. But I always tried to focus on that. And then I also wanted to focus on whiskey from the perspective of a hobbyist, uh, you know, just a mom or dad who drink, likes to drink bourbon, not really a professional, just somebody that enjoys bourbon and wants to share it with other people. So never gained money from my blog. Um, it's always just been about loving this hobby and trying to share it with others. Having said that, you know, if somebody wants to hire me and pay me to do this stuff, it's totally fine. That's, that's totally cool. So I, there's a topic I want to cover today about whiskey tastings that I think um, from our standpoint is something that we can push out to others. And you'll find that it actually uh, leads to a lot of, a lot of positives in uh, the whiskey world. So um, I know a lot of us, many of us probably have done a bourbon tasting that looks a little bit like this. A whole bunch of bottles brought together. Everybody brings a bunch of bottles, throws it on the table. You start tasting, may have looked like this. Uh, essentially, you're just, I don't know if you're tasting as much as just going overboard on a whole bunch of whiskey. And ultimately, you end up probably looking like this. So that is not what we are going to cover today. That is not the kind of tasting that I want to talk about. Those are actually pretty easy tastings. I know there's also um, tastings that you can do by pairing food. Um, restaurants may have a bourbon tasting. You may um, be better at the culinary arts and come up with a bourbon tasting. That is also not my forte. Um, I do recommend you take a look at Peggy No Stevens from 3 to 3.30 today. She will be doing some uh, food and bourbon pairings. My focus is bringing together non-whiskey people into a neighborhood tasting. And I'm going to expand on this a little bit more, but this is what it looked like when we set up our first whiskey tasting back in 2014. And here's another look at how we expanded when we went to 2015. Um, so let's get into a little bit of detail. That's kind of the focus of what I wanted to talk about here today. So why host a bourbon tasting? I can promise you there's a neighbor uh, either in your apartment complex or your condo unit or in your neighborhood who probably has not left their house in 15 years, or you've never seen them leave your house, leave their house. As soon as you plan a bourbon tasting, they are all coming out of their house. We had one, the first one that we did, I had only lived in the neighborhood for about a year. And people who had been in the neighborhood for 10 years said, who is, who is that? Who is that? Um, people who just hadn't come to social events, they came out because of whiskey. Um, another great thing about doing a neighborhood bourbon tasting, you can have fun with all without the kids, all within walking distance from home. You don't have to get an Uber. You don't have to spend money at a bar. You don't have to um, pay for a fancy meal. Not that there's anything wrong with any of that, but there's just something fun about being able to walk, have fun with a group of people over a common interest, and then walk back home. Um, you can create connections with people that share these similar interests. And a bonus is they live close by. The first whiskey tasting that we did in our neighborhood actually led to the creation of a barrel picking group 
that we called North Atlanta Whiskey Society. And, um, and it spread out from there. We, we ended up having seven barrels, ended up getting all these people locally that were part of the group and was just a, a really great benefit from having that. I would have never known that all these people were that into whiskey had we not done the neighborhood tasting. Um, it's very casual in a neighborhood bourbon tasting. You don't need to memorize everything. You can bring notes. Both times that I came, I had notes and just read from the notes. It's very casual. You don't have to memorize anything and it doesn't have to be pretentious. You don't have to be, you know, spitting out all the rules of bourbon. You can explain to all of them, but you don't have to, you know, make it very uh, snooty ish, if you will. And trust me when I say this, every adult, at least one in every household wants you to throw one. They've been looking for a reason to go have some fun on a Friday night from their neighborhood. It is a easy, fun occasion that you can do. Um, another thing that I just want to mention, um, I was able to build a good relationship with the local store by doing, um, by doing a tasting. And honestly, all it was was walking into the store and saying, hey, guys, I plan on put, putting on a neighborhood bourbon tasting. Uh, this is my idea. Do you want to, you know, if you guys can get me the bourbon that I need, of course you're paying for it, but for some of the higher, the harder to get stuff, if you can help me get it, you know, I'm happy to put cards for your store up, that kind of thing. So it was, it was, a, it's a great way to help build a relationship with a local store. So fall of 2014, I, um, I had my first bourbon tasting in the neighborhood. I had just gotten into bourbon. Uh, as you can see, I was really skinny back then, so I had not um, really started started the bourbon. Um, I had not yet started a blog. Um, I didn't know much about bourbon except that I liked it. Um, again, I stood there and I read notes that I had, and it was an incredible time. To this day, people still talk about the first bourbon tasting that we threw and how it brought out a neighborhood of people who had not had events in a while. Now, at the time, Elmer T. Lee and Eagle Rare were not as difficult to get. So I think one of the one of the things you have to work with is what's an easily accessible bourbon. In 2014, you could get Eagle Rare very easily, and Elmer had just started to get a little bit tougher. But my idea was to focus on three uh, Buffalo Trace low-proof bourbons that at the time were not hard to get. And then there was a craft... Uh, whiskey that provided me a barrel, which I thought was the coolest thing ever. So I, you know, I brought, um, I brought the barrel and um, I'll, I'll talk about having a craft mixed with established distilleries a little bit later, but that's the first one we did. So you'll see here on the left, I stood there with notes that I printed out because I didn't know that much. Um, you know, I mean, I knew, like I said, bourbon was, could be made anywhere in the U S and I knew some of the basic rules but one of the things people still talk about is that I had custom engraved glasses made for the event. They were they were cheap. They were not that expensive. I want to say they were like eight bucks a glass with the engraving. And people still to this day will say, I still have my Chad's Walk, um, you know, custom engraved glass. And I love it. I personally drink too much bourbon and the dishwasher took off all of the, the stuff on it. But if you're somebody who maybe doesn't drink as much bourbon, um, a custom engraved glass is a way to go. It's something that will carry the memory of that night with you forward um, for a while. So, so that was a really fun time. Uh, fall of 2015, cha things changed a little bit. I actually, uh, as I had started to build relationships, I had mentioned to a local store here that I wanted to do basically a four roses tasting where I went from yellow label to small batch to single barrel to barrel strength. Um, I think at the time I'd only been in the hobby for about one year, had some store relationships, but it was not a lot, but honestly, it doesn't take a lot. Um, it's honestly as easy as going in, talking to the, the bar man, the liquor manager and saying, I'm hosting a bourbon tasting for 40 people in my neighborhood. The neighborhood is right around the corner. Can you reach out to the brand manager or even the distributor and see if they can provide anything for the tasting? So this year for the Four Roses tour that I did, I got t-shirts, hats. I got a um, little uh, books, Four Roses books. I got pamphlets. I don't remember what was in the pamphlets, a little tasting sheet, and then actually a barrel head that I got. So it was just, 
it was cool. Now I did buy all the whiskey. None of the whiskey was provided for free. Um, all the whiskey was paid for from my local store at retail price. It was not discounts on anything. And that's, that's fine because you are collecting and I'll go over that in a little bit, but you do want to collect um, an entry fee. So still read from my notes, still had an amazing time as we expanded on it. Um, you'll see here, I, I stood up and was just kind of talking about uh, the bourbon. And then on the right, I think as we got a little bit later in the night, I wanted to take a picture of what was left. But in this case, we went from yellow label to small batch to single barrel, then to barrel strength. And um, again, another amazing event that people still talk about that required very, very little planning. Fall of 2016, some people had said, hey, maybe we try not bourbon. And I said, okay. So we spread the love out to other whiskey because, look, this is a whiskey from home conference. We're all about all the whiskeys, so it's not a problem. So we we did rye uh, with Sazerac rye. We did single malt. We did blended malt. We did Japanese whiskey. Also had some uh, weeded whiskey, um, the one from Heaven Hill. I'm drawing a blank on it now, but um, we did that one. And people actually asked if we could go back to bourbon after that. So I think one of the important things is to kind of remember your, know what your audience is. You know, here in Georgia, bourbon reigns supreme. Um, but there's a lot of areas where it may not, and people may want to branch out to different stuff. So we just learned after our third bourbon tasting that people love bourbon uh, more than anything else. So let's talk about how to host a whiskey tasting. First thing, very simple. If you have an HOA or you have a social chair, then send them an email and say you want to host a whiskey tasting. That is step number one. It's easy. All it takes is a small email. And I promise you that nine out of 10 times, the people are going to say that is a fantastic idea. I would love if you would do that. Um, the next thing you need to decide is where you're going to host it. There are a lot of common areas that, for example, in our neighborhood, we have tennis courts that have a pavilion, so it's a covered outdoor area. And we decided the tennis pavilion was perfect. Um, if you don't have a clubhouse, if you don't have a pool house, maybe even just a cul-de-sac, like let's, let's come into a cul-de-sac where everybody can get together, maybe in the middle of the neighborhood, um, somewhere we can get together and um, you know have it. Worst case scenario, you can have it at your house, just be prepared for a mess and the cleanup involved in it. At least when you're in a mutual area, it's easier for everybody to clean up. Um, decide what kind of whiskey tasting you're going to have. So, of course, you know, here you can, it's up to you um, what you want to do. You can focus on a single style of whiskey, um, which I, I do recommend. If you're going to do a whiskey tasting, stick to one type of whiskey. Stick to either bourbon or rye or single malt. I think when you get into the mixing the different kinds, you really confuse their taste buds because they may really love the smoothness of a bourbon and then they get the spiciness of a rye and then maybe they get the saltiness of a single malt and it's just going to confuse them. Try to focus on a single style. Uh, be aware of the weather in your area when choosing your date. I, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, it's pretty obvious. If you can have a covered area or somewhere you can do it inside, that's always preferred. I fully recommend a Friday night everybody is, is, you know, you're tired, but you also really want a reason to leave your kids and go get some alcohol. So um, Friday night to me is a great night to do it in your neighborhood. And this is really important. I did not want to involve the food pairing. The, the food pairing is a whole nother level of palate refinement that I don't have because, I mean, I eat pizza bites after having bourbon. So I say just try to do it after dinner. Schedule it for 8.30 p.m. on a Friday. Of course, we want to have some snacks because we, we don't want things to go downhill, um, you know, as quickly as that. But 8.30 p.m. on a Friday night had the, the best um, reception and the most amount of people possible. So try to stick to something like that. Okay, so the hardest part, again, selecting the whiskey. I think four to five options um, is good. You don't want to go too much more than that because you really want to kind of focus. And once you get past maybe the fifth option, uh, then the buzz is taking over and the taste buds are maybe burned a little bit. And you're going to find that people will stop really being able to taste the whiskey. So 
Um, you can do, you know, this is where you can get creative. You could do whiskey from the same distillery or the same state or country. Uh, distillers with similar mash bills, you know, find a theme. And honestly, whatever you decide, people are going to love. Get creative with it. It doesn't matter. People just want to hang out. One important thing I would say is don't try to mix craft whiskey with older distillery and established distilleries. We did that with our first one and it's just had, it's, there's no chance for the craft whiskey to hold up against that. It's okay to do a craft whiskey tasting, but I just think that when you bring the young profile with a lot more of the alcohol taste into a smoother, older bourbon, you don't give the craft whiskey a chance. Um, try to stick with lower proof. You know, a lot of the people that are coming, I'd say half of them maybe typically drink 80 proof whiskey with soda and that's okay. But if you start pulling out the 120 proof bourbon, you're going to burn out their taste buds pretty quickly. So if you are going to have a stronger proof, I would say maybe push that towards the end and start with the lower proof, something that's a little easier for them to start trying and be creative. Look, keep in mind, most people just want to hang out and they want to drink good bourbon. They're not judging what you selected. They're not judging what you're going to say. They're actually going to be honestly come away impressed. I didn't know barely anything I was talking about my first year. And people said, I'd love how you told us about the whiskey. I love that we got to try the different whiskeys. And they focus on the positive, which is honestly sharing a great time over a single uh, product, which in this case, of course, is whiskey. So a little preparation, reach out to your local store, tell them what you're doing, say, hey, I'm gonna do a bourbon tasting. I've got 35 people lined up. Is there any chance you could reach out to uh, the distillery or the brand that you've chosen? See if they can provide some swag, glasses, um, t-shirts, marketing material, anything that you can get as just stuff for people to take home with is always is good. And it doesn't cost you anything. You're just asking people, hey, can, do you have some stuff? Um, see about getting someone to make you glasses for your event. Again, this was this was kind of a big deal. We um, had some glasses made with Chaz Walk Bourbon tasting on them. People still talk about the glasses that they got to take home and, and really appreciated that as just kind of a souvenir uh, and a memory that they could take with them. Uh, charge a cover fee if your HOA won't cover it. We had a specific cover fee up front. People paid it. Um, nowadays, you know, you can just use Venmo and collect ahead of time. We had, I actually hired a, a teenager in the neighborhood to set up a table. And when people were walking up the hill to collect the fees and then they put their names on a glass. So make sure you collect the fees, let them know that there'll be a cover. And of course, advertise your event, but be prepared to cut off the list. If you end up with, with too many people, you may not have enough bourbon for it all. You may not be able to talk. People may be talking over you. We, our first event was 35 people. And to me, that was a, that was a great size. Our Four Roses event got to be about 45. And then the uh, general whiskey event got to be about 50, which to me was a little bit, it was a little bit high. It's a little bit too much. So just try to keep it at a good number and don't be afraid to say, look, we're cut off unless somebody else um, cancels. So some things that you need. Um, first off, you're going to need a cooler with bags of ice. You, of course, people are going to want to put ice in their whiskey and that is totally okay. However they wanna drink it, we're not concerned. They're gonna get the flavors that you want them to get, whether they have ice or they have water, um, or even if they wanna put a splash of soda into it. Don't worry about that. Um, print out your notes, bring them with you. Of course, bring your whiskey because otherwise your tasting will suck. Um, custom glasses or if you just wanna use disposable plastic cups, that's fine. You're gonna need to bring water, um, we had two sources of water. One was for people to, to just kind of drink as they went. Another one was a large gallon, a uh, couple gallons of water so that people could rinse their glass out as we went to the next item on the list to taste. So make sure you bring plenty of water. You're going to want to bring some light bar snacks because people are going to need to start eating something and putting it in their belly or things go downhill pretty quickly. We do want to try to keep it... Um, as much of a tasting as long as possible. I will explain later. At some point your tasting will break down, but that's totally fine. A uh, bag of coffee beans. Somebody had told me about this. If you smell coffee beans, it's actually um, a kind of a palate cleanser. So I brought a bag of coffee beans. Somebody stole it and made coffee with it at their house probably for a week. And I hope they really enjoyed it because I would have, 
I would have had that coffee, but whatever. So um, just know that somebody may take it from you. So be prepared. Some will come just for the tasting. This is what I tell everybody. You, um, There's going to be two halves to your bourbon tasting. The first half will be the tasting, and people are going to come out, and they're going to taste, and they're going to socialize, and then they're going to leave. And then you have the drinkers who stay. And all three times we have done this, things devolved into chaos. But they're great memories. I mean, you know what you're prepared for. Hopefully you've given them some water, you've given them some snacks. Uh, we still have people who talk about the craziness that ensued after the first night. But again, we're making memories. Just don't, you know, you're in the neighborhood, nobody's getting in a car, nobody's gonna do anything bad. You're just, you're having fun. But just know things will take a turn when the tasters leave. Um, again, you make friends for life. I, so many people that I met at this first bourbon testing, again, that we did in our neighborhood, we made a whiskey club with. I still hang out with them all the time. We have drinks. It's, it's really, really fun. And again, try to keep it consistent. If you, everyone has a great time, do it again the next year. Do it again six months later. Do it every Friday night. Do whatever people want to do to come together for whiskey. Um, how to do the tasting? Well, again, start with the lowest proof. Pour an ounce or a half ounce. Um, pour small because the idea is to start small slowly. They can pour some more later once they've had it, but start small with the pours. Knows the bourbon and ask them to tell you what they smell. Remind them there's no right or wrong answer, but you don't want to influence them and say, I smell caramel, I smell um, cinnamon, I smell baking powder, or I smell, um, what's that stuff Fred Minnick likes to smell? You know, uh, that stuff. You, you just, you don't tell them that. You let them tell you what they smell. And then again, also have them try it and tell them, you know, what they, what they think, what's their tasting notes. There's no right or wrong answer. It's all about just having fun. Um, you know, as they're trying it, explain the product line history or the distillery history. People, you know, do still want to leave with some knowledge before they leave. And again, as I said before, have them rinse out their glass before moving on to the next one and bring coffee beans so they can sniff them and clear their palate and steal your coffee beans and make great coffee when they go home. So, I know that in this time frame, it's difficult to talk about planning a physical event that we're all together. So it is still possible to do a virtual bourbon tasting. So I don't, I, I hope most of you are familiar. Some of you may be, some of you may not be, but um, uh, let's make sure I can see this on my camera. Um, this is a two ounce Boston round. It is a glass jar. You can order 12 packs of these from Amazon. I believe the cost is usually around a dollar per bottle. And if you wanted to, you could fill these up with bourbon. Usually they come with a little funnel that you can use. Fill them up, label them, put some uh, painter's tape on them, label them, and drop them off in a bag at people's houses. Give it a week for the people to feel comfortable opening it up. Uh, increase the price of cost to cover both the bourbon and the um you know, the Boston round glasses and do a zoom. You know, it's easy to share whiskey that way. There's no cleanup. It's nice and easy. And again, you get to experience, um, to me, the greatest part of our hobby. And that is a tasting with friends and people that we may not be, may not fully know. So uh, that's it for the presentation that I have. Um, you can subscribe on my blog, www.suburbia.com. Uh, on Instagram, I'm at Suburbia. On Twitter, I'm at Bourbon underscore Gamer because somebody stole Suburbia. And occasionally I sub in on the Bourbon Pursuit Roundtable, usually giving away some freebies at the end. So um, are there any questions that you all have? Yeah, we definitely have a few questions. And, and yeah, make sure you check out Kerry on the roundtables because he ends up giving away like, what was it, like 1980s Eagle Rare to just random yeah. people on the internet. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> so so kate has a great question uh whiskey music do you play any music to like create an ambiance like uh, during a tasting or anything like that the ones that we've done had over 30 people and we did not try music because i just felt like it would be harder for people to kind of talk and share their ideas and and honestly people they also want to just catch up with each other so uh, you know there could have been a fine balance between being too loud with music and 
low enough that nobody even knew that music was playing. So we have not tried that, but it's not a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, I know Fred has done uh, kind of like you can do music and whiskey pairings now. Like you're trying to figure out a way, like, can you figure out uh, as you're tasting something, is there a vibe or something that you can get out of a certain kind of music as well? Uh, let's see. There's another one from Karen. Uh, she had asked, are there any legal implications maybe about securing a place to kind of host something? And if you were to do it through the HOA, is there like a central meeting location? Do you prefer to just say like, hey, somebody's got to offer up their house? That's a great question. We had actually consulted with our lawyers before having the bourbon tasting and their concern was not, was mainly underage consumption. So we did have um, somebody check IDs for everyone that came up. That's a good point. Um, we checked everyone's ID to make sure that they were over 21 uh, that came up, but there did not seem to be any liability issues um, from being in the same place and drinking like that. It's like club carry. Yeah. <laughs> James asks if you can share some of those cost numbers. I mean, I know the Boston rounds that can get pricey if you start buying a lot of them, but you know, you had mentioned collecting money and funds uh, up front yep. for this. Um, so what are some of those cost numbers? And then I'll add a, another question on there. It was like, what does some of this go towards? Uh, does it actually go towards like buying the bottles or is everybody supposed to bring one bottle? Like kind of, kind of talk about what are the costs cover? Sure. So we actually, um, that both, all three of the tastings we did were paid by people coming. I didn't feel it was right to use HOA money because uh, there is a social budget for our neighborhood, but I didn't feel it was right to cover an event that only, you know, 40, 35 or 40 people went to. So we, we covered just enough from the cover fee to cover all the bottles, all the um, merchandise that I had paid for. I think the first bourbon tasting we did, it ended up being $20 per person. And we had about 35 people. So that covered the glasses. I had three bottles of Eagle Rare, three bottles of Elmer, three bottles of Buffalo Trace, and I was given for free that cask that had a local craft um, thing. And it also covered the water, the ice. So we, we broke even on that. The second one, um, I think it was also $20, but I had a lot of, uh, the glasses were free. They were provided by Four Roses. All the merchandise was free. So I think pretty much everyone we did, we tried to keep it so that it was a $20 cover fee and people were fine with that. They'd come up, they'd bring the $20, we'd mark them off on a list and it didn't cost the HOA any money. Yeah. Keep it, keep it easy. Yeah. Don't, don't blow out a budget. I guess that'll yeah. be fine. Um, you know, another kind of question that uh, came in here is how did you do your invitations? Did you do like a, like a funny, like jib jab or something like come meet Carrie, yeah. like a bobbling head? Uh, no, I um, actually sent out an email to uh, the neighborhood at the time, it was just a, hey, is anybody interested in doing a whiskey tasting? If so, send me an email. And then I put a sign at the front of the neighborhood that said whiskey tasting, email me. And it's like everybody turned into the neighborhood and was like, yes. And my emails just started coming in and coming in. And uh, so those are the two ways I did it. One was a, an, an email to the neighborhood. Now, some neighborhoods, you may have, you know, the, the sheet that you can put in people's um, doors. But I think honestly, just putting a sign up and say you know, at the front of your neighborhood or the front of your complex, whiskey tasting, um, give it an evening um, RSVP to give an email address, say $20 cover fee. I think that's a great way to kind of get the word out. I think uh, you kind of like jog my memory of like old school, be like, Frank, I heard you or like, hey, I heard you're starting a fraternity, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want in. I, I want in. I want in. <laughs> Now, the other kind of thing that you had brought up is I, I think that most people probably never even think of it, of actually going to a, a liquor store and saying like, hey, can you contact the rep and figure out like, is there kind of swag? So what's like the coolest swag that you've ever gotten as a part of doing this? Definitely the Four Roses was the coolest thing I've ever got. And I I, I couldn't even believe it too. They, the, uh, the local store I was working with reached out to Four Roses rep and said, uh, here's a guy, he's doing a bourbon tasting. He's doing all Four Roses. He's bought all the four roses from our store. So he bought, uh, I believe I bought two of each, um, yellow label, small batch, single barrel and barrel strength. And they said, can you provide anything for him? And I'm telling you two days later at my doorstep was uh, 24 glasses and the barrel head, a bunch of t-shirts, the four roses books. I mean, they, they went to the nines. And I think a lot of distilleries, they want to, you know, they want to give you this stuff. They know that you're now presenting a brand to, 40 people and 30 may have never heard of it before. And they may leave there saying, I want this brand. I want Four Roses. I want Buffalo Trace. I want this Elmer T. Lee. Tell me what store I can go to get it in. 
So I think, you know, brands probably are, are willing to give you some stuff. You just need to, you can't hurt to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for coming on. It was fantastic. I know there's actually some people in the chat that said they want your presentation. So I'll get the, I'll get it uh, in any presentations after this, and I'll make sure I send it uh, with a link that anybody can download through Eventbrite. So make sure that you're registered through Eventbrite and you'll get the opportunity to download those as well as you'd saw the coupon code to get Brian's book earlier. Awesome. But hey, Carrie, appreciate it. You did an awesome job, man. Thank you so much for having me, guys. You got it. Talk to All you right, soon. Bye-bye.